Hello class, welcome back. Today's lecture is for Wednesday, April 22nd. Yesterday we talked about uh, containment and the creation of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which was the alliance of Western Europe and the US promising uh, support both economically and militarily against uh, any kind of communist invasion, or communist threat. So the communist countries of Eastern Europe, specifically the Soviet Union, takes that as a threat and so they create their own pact known as the Warsaw Pact. This is essentially just Stalin looking at NATO and saying, well, if you have your own little club, your own little friends group, then I'm going to make my own. So he, I don't really want to say forces, but he technically he forces uh, the Eastern Bloc, you know, the Iron Curtain countries to align themselves with him. And it's purely, uh, you know, the wording is, Basically, uh, the Soviet Union will assist and help any of the Eastern European countries if they get invaded by a Western European country or by the U.S., and vice versa. If the Soviet Union were to get invaded, uh, then the, saddle, then the uh, Eastern European countries would jump in and help them. So why is it formed? Well, like I said, it's to counter NATO. It's to provide some, some relief or some a safety net, basically, if things go south, figuratively speaking. And it's an anti-Western military alliance, anti-capitalism, anti-democracy. So it, it's unifying. Uh, all of those now communist countries in Eastern Europe with the Soviet Union. Now, why is it called Warsaw? Well, it's created in the city of Warsaw, Poland, capital of Poland. That's where this whole thing is signed and agreed to. So, I use the term satellite nation. A satellite nation is a country or state that is dependent upon another country, whether that's economic, usually it's both economically and militarily. So it's, a, it's an independent country that is recognized by the rest of the world as an, as an independent country, but their, their own safety or defense is provided by someone else, a stronger country. And that's really all that Eastern Europe was. They're all independent countries, but they're all puppets to the Soviet Union. You know, satellite nations in Eastern Europe were Bulgaria, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, and East Germany. And then eventually it stretches to like Yugoslavia uh, and, and other Baltic countries like that. So America's had a history with satellite nations as well. You know, just about any, any of the most powerful countries in the world at any given time are gonna have, a sat, gonna have satellite nations. Um, like during this time, West Germany was probably a satellite nation of the US. Uh, South Korea, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, uh, was a satellite nation of the US. Taiwan, uh, some current or more more recent satellite nations. You could say that Iraq was a satellite nation after the U.S. disposed of Saddam Hussein, uh, since the U.S. had a lot of military influence there and they were kind of acting on uh, U.S. authority. 
Another one that may be a little controversial, but in my eyes, and by this definition, I believe it to be true, uh, I think Israel is possibly a, a, an American satellite state, possibly. Now, Israel does have quite a bit of sovereignty itself and quite a bit of power and even military power, at least as far as weapons go. But they are pretty dependent on American support and American defense. They have to be. Israel, for some reason, is hated by just about every country on the planet except the U.S. I mean, they are probably the most hated country in the world. And it, a lot of it stems to biblical days. Um, the U.S. is about the only, I guess, you know, American allies are probably fine with Israel, like England and France are, I'm sure, on decent terms. But uh, most of the rest of the world just really has it out for Israel. That's neither here nor there. I got off on a tangent there. My apologies. There's a map of the Warsaw Pact when it's signed. Um, I mean, yeah, they all provide a defense with the Soviet Union. Uh, you might see in that little bottom southwest or, or bottom left uh, corner, there's a little country, it's kind of striped, but it's not solidly a part of the Iron Curtain, at least not geographically. That little country is Albania. And Albania ends up getting out of the Warsaw Pact uh, a couple years after it first joins it and it's over a disagreement about the Warsaw Pact ended up in uh, those countries invaded uh, I believe it was Hungary Hungary went through a, my, a, a little bit of a, a civil war or revolution where a communist leader overthrew another communist leader and the Soviet Union liked the original communist leader. So when he's kicked out, the Soviet Union steps in and tells the Warsaw Pact countries, hey, we got to go invade Hungary and put down this rebellion. And Albania was very against it. And they ended up being so fed up with it that they get out of the Warsaw Pact and then, uh, which they needed help to do that. Uh, basically the NATO countries adopted Albania and said, if you guys try and do anything to Albania, then it'll escalate into conflict. So the Soviet Union decided, well, Albania is so small and not really strategically important. It's not worth it. So continuing Truman's containment policy, it stretches into Asia. As you can see, this is the domino uh, theory is coming into play. Communism is spreading quickly and there's, there's things to deal with. Now some successes of Truman's containment policy comes in Japan. Japan, you have to understand, is very weak after World War II. And when a country is weak, they are susceptible to communism. And the U.S. saw that and decided we need to kind of do what we've been doing with West Germany. And instead of trying to hold them down, build them back up. So they do that to Japan. Provide a lot of money, provide a lot of economic opportunities. And Japan flourishes. That's why... That's a huge reason why today Japan is such a huge economic power. Like so many goods are distributed or cre created in Japan and sold in the U.S. 
and it's because of the quick action that was taken after World War II to try and revive Japan. And we signed the security treaties with them, which basically pledges our support and our assistance in Japan to make sure that they stay afloat and they never feel the need to turn communist. The Philippines is another another one. If you remember World War II, Japan invades and takes over the Philippines for a couple years. And even before that, the Philippines had a peasant group that was known as the Hake, which it was H-A-K. It was short for a longer name, which I can't pronounce. But the Hake was a communist group of peasants that went around the countryside in some of the Philippine islands and basically massacred and killed a bunch of the landowners. You know, the peasant class uprising against the, the more wealthy. Well, they were instrumental in kicking out the Japanese during World War II. Like, they fought a little bit. The Hake fought alongside American soldiers while they were trying to defeat the Japanese. And then when the Japanese are kicked out of the Philippines, they think the hey the communists of the Philippines think all is well, but then the US decides to stay and occupy. Well, they don't like that. So these attacks continue, and then the US gets out of the Philippines and the Hague decides, hey, we're gonna continue until we've completely kicked out the somewhat democratic government of the Philippines. And luckily, they're not terribly strong in numbers. They commit atrocities. They do horrible things. And the U.S. provides financial support, and they sell weapons to the Philippine government. And the Hake is destroyed, and with it, communism in the Philippines is destroyed. So that's another success of containment for Truman. Now, a major failure of containment was China. China under Mao. That means China under the guidance of a man named Mao Zedong. Mao was a follower of Karl, he was a Marx-Leninist, meaning he was a follower of Karl Marx and then of Karl Marx's writing, if you remember Karl Marx is the author of the Communist Manifesto, and then Vladimir Lenin was a Soviet, or was a Russian that led the Russian Revolution in 1919, which created the Soviet Union. So Mao was a follower of those two, and China was one of those, they were just so downtrodden and destroyed from World War II because of the Japanese, that when Japan is defeated in World War II, then China's you know, back to being essentially independent. And so with it, there's a battle for not only who's going to lead China, but in what way, you know, what kind of government. And so there's the, a group called the Kuomintang, which was a more democratic government, and they were opposed by the People's Republic of China, or the Communist, it started as the Communist Party of China. And the U.S. decides to send some people over to kind of not engage in warfare early, but to get a feel for what the situation is like in China. And, and these Americans go back home and report to Truman that um, the Communist Party of China is way more organized and way more supported by the Chinese people and also less corrupt. The Kuomintang had a lot of corruption and poor leadership. And, you know, they were, they called themselves a democracy, but if they'd won, they wouldn't have been, a, I mean, they, they, it would have been a police state and it would have been a dictatorship. It just wouldn't have been communist. And you'll find the U.S. really doesn't care if you're a dictatorship. We just care if you're communist. And so the U.S. continues to back the Kuomintang, but Mao Zedong and the Communist Party of China ends up winning, and 
China becomes communist. Now, they start out pretty communist, but they eventually shift their economy. And that's, that's why China today is such an economic power. They're not an economic power because of communism. Because I would argue that today, China's got more capitalist policies than the U.S. does. Like the way they operate is not communist really very much at all. And they were a little more communist under Mao, but since then they've kind of adapted. They still call themselves communist, but I don't I don't believe it. I don't see it. So China becomes communist and shortly after Mao signs a treaty or an agreement with the Soviet Union the Sino-Soviet uh, tre Alliance Treaty or Mutual Alliance Treaty, which scares the crap out of the, out of the US. Oh, they hate that. Now, not only is China communist, but they are aligning themselves with our enemy. That scares the daylights out of us. Uh, but relations between Mao and Stalin kind of fall apart eventually, and they don't remain very close allies, at least not for long. Now you see Taiwan there. Taiwan's interesting. I, I guess I could have, uh, technically I could have put Taiwan under success. Taiwan's an island just off the coast of China. And it was a Chinese state. Like it was just another Chinese territory. But they don't take to communism. The U.S. actually fights to protect Taiwan. And Taiwan gets like bombed and, and beat up pretty bad by the Chinese. But the U.S., after seeing China fall, decides we don't want Taiwan to fall. So they provide a little more effort and more assistance. And Taiwan is able to fend off the Chinese. And Taiwan wins its independence from China. And it remains capitalist and democratic. and that's the way it is to this day. And again, Taiwan's also considering its size and its small size and not that big population, they're pretty powerful economically too. So you could say Taiwan was somewhat of a success, but um, they still had to fight for their freedoms and economic rights from China, which had fallen under Mao. And there's some atrocities committed in China under Mao. Mao does some good things, like increasing women's rights and increasing the economic distribution or economic power of China, but there's some atrocities he commits along the way, uh, like starving his own people and, you know, the, it's believed that he ordered the explosion of a huge river dam because just on the other side of the dam was all these villages of peasants that were living on the countryside and it was said he exploded the dam so that way it caused mass flooding and kill and they believe like millions of peasants were killed because of this and he was just trying to eliminate uh the bottom feeders. And then he also, you know, executed a bunch of anti-communist citizens and politicians. So now today's question, what is a satellite nation? Give definition back on that first slide. Not that difficult. Add it to the document that hopefully you've got Mondays and Tuesdays on and you'll be good to go. Um, so yeah, that'll be it for today. We're, we're moving slowly, but surely. So progress is being made. Stick to it. Stay with me. We only got a couple weeks left. Let's finish strong. Uh, finish all your classes. Stay busy and, uh, have a good one.